friends were one of my best friends and a colleague from my country in Melbourne University. Thank you. So I'm still officially blown away by Dr. Mustafa Sisei's talk. And I hear there's a field medalist and touring bodies in this audience. So I would like to start my talk with a, an apology. And I have been um, exposed a lot to the media and, and marketing uh, in the past year. I've been talking to audiences to whom I've had to give very high level talks. I just got back from the World Economic Forum and pretty much didn't have time to prepare a talk that was good enough for this audience. So my apologies in the beginning. It's going to be a bit high level. Um, I am, of course, I am from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. I am affiliated with the School of Computer Science, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and the Institute of Strategic Analysis at Carnegie Mellon. And my talk today is on AI-driven voice forensics, and we'll see what that means during my, the course of my high-level talk. Um, the topic is what is in the human voice profiling humans from their voice. So basically, I'm just going to tell you some stories here, how it all started, what I'm doing now, and please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. I'm happy to answer during my talk. Okay, so it all started, before I tell you what profiling from the human voice means, uh, let me tell you how it started. It all started when, um, when I was uh, challenged with solving a couple of crimes. And I began looking into what was beyond computer speech recognition, which is what I was working on for 20 years um, in the human voice. So we'll talk about Okay, I'm going to talk about three incidents, go as fast as I can, involving three criminals. Now, the first one is this gentleman here. Uh, I have been talking about him for two years now, and this is not something that I'm presenting for the first time here. Um, the question I started asking myself at the time uh, I was faced with uh, looking at other criminals' voices was what was it that made this man um, uh, so powerful in Germany? There, there's been a lot of spe speculation about it. As a personality, he was hardly anything. If he passed you in the corridor, you would not notice him. Uh, maybe he was at the right place at the right time saying the right things, but there were lots of other people saying the right things at the right time. Take a look at how he was able to uh, move audiences. <coughs> And 
that list includes dominance and leadership qualities. There have been lots of studies on uh, how the human voice encodes leadership qualities and dominance characteristics. Here's an example of a paper. Uh, voice pitch influences voting behavior. The first sentence in the abstract says it may be adaptive for voters to recognize good leadership qualities. Among politicians, men with low-pitched voices are found to be more dominant, and it goes on. Um, here's another paper. Sounds like a winner. Voice pitch influences perception of leadership capacity. So I was very curious. I wanted to, I wanted to find out if this is something that's quantifiable, can be measured uh, for other purposes, as you will see in the, in the next examples. And there have been lots of uh, uh, studies on what we perceive from the human voice in the literature. I look at all of that, and this is a random example from 2008. We perceive a lot of things like age, appearance, height, competence, emotional status, intelligence, education, <coughs> occupation. All of these are these all quantifiable? That was a question uh, that I was exploring, um, and instead, this is what I found. These are representations of the vocal tract excitation. I will explain what that means uh, uh, later on in the talk. Vocal tract excitation patterns of three different people saying the word uh. Do you see how the one in the center is different from the ones on the sides? The persons on the sides are healthy. The person in the center has Parkinson's. I took Hitler's speech from 1934 and instead of See what he does. He holds his hand like this. Um, look at the visual patterns here. You can see signs of Parkinson's right there. It, it appears that in 1934 he already had Parkinson's. He was never diagnosed. People have only suspected it from his video evidence. The way he holds his hands to hide his tremor. He used to put, a, put his hands behind his back to hide the tremors. So, okay. But this is still not quantifiable. That was one discovery. The second one um, is a little story that I will tell you very fast. And it starts with a dark and stormy night, like all good stories. Um, so it begins in June 2014. The United States Coast Guard gets many distress calls each year. And these are mayday calls. They are made over radio channel 16, which is designated uh, as the International Distress Channel. When they get these calls, they have to launch what are called SAR missions. SAR missions are search and rescue missions. They send out boats and helicopters and specially trained personnel, and often they have to search hundreds of square miles at sea. It's very dangerous. In June of 2014, somebody kept called the Coast Guard, and the call went like this. They launched the SAR mission, went out searching for the guy. They didn't find the vessel. Remember that such a mission costs a lot of money and it requires special resources. It puts people's lives in danger. In July, he calls again. It's the same person. Mayday, Mayday, they launched another SAR mission. August, he calls again. SAR mission finds no boat. August again, guy is a serial boat sinker. He has a he has a talent for getting into trouble at sea. September he calls again. Turns out all of these calls were hoax calls. And they were made by the same person. Well, so from an analysis of about 10 seconds worth of speech, this is what we found. The person is white, he's brought up in America, probably in the Northeast. He's about 175 centimeters tall. He weighs about 75 kilograms. He's about 40 years old. Person is not in any kind of trouble. He's not on a boat. He's in a warehouse of some kind. The warehouse has many machines. His radio room has a glass wall. His equipment is homemade. He's still learning how to use it. He's sitting on a metal chair on a concrete floor. <laughs> they found him after three months. We were right on every count. Uh, and this is what I call profiling humans from their voice. That was crime number two. That got me started off on this crime. Crime number three was, again, a series of hoax calls. There was this lady 
Mm -hmm. Play on some of uh, her calls. Um, information from several fields and uh, putting it together with what I knew of the human voice and how to study it. Turned out all of these are the same person. <coughs> we humans are a very devious face. If you commit a crime through voice, we are going to try to change our voice to not sound like our voices. So this female turned out to be a Hispanic female and these were the parameters that I deduced. So, these three crimes together put me in the path of profiling. I, I stopped working on computer speech recognition and started looking deeper into what is in the human voice, just how much information is there in the human voice, and what do we perceive, what do we not perceive, is it still there and can be ex uh, extracted, and how do we extract it? How do we relate it to the human, uh, to human parameters? Um, along the, it, this is, Part of the report that uh, was returned to the Coast Guard um, along with the uh, analysis, I was able to, there were agent sounds in the background and uh, I was able to kind of give them a description of the boat, kind of boat that she was on. But the science of profiling started from there and what I'm going to tell you about today is why, why you have already guessed. Um, what I am doing in, um, to further the science, um, I'm going to talk about microarticulometry, the role of artificial intelligence in it, um, how I'm dealing with voice disguise, which was exemplifi exemplified by the third crime, and uh, my latest work on uh, where I am at this point. So, voice is evidence in many, many crimes, um, as we know. Um, it, there are lots of crimes that are happening where um, it's just an evidence, of, for example, the robbery on the left here. The person is masked, but he may have said something. Um, there are other crimes that are committed through, through voice. The voice is the key evidence, maybe the only evidence in those crimes. Harassment, fraud, uh, threats, extortion, propaganda. There are so many crimes like that. Ransom calls, blackmail, most calls are the ones that I was dealing with. Um, so this is, I'm going to skip this. Um, I have the wrong set of slides over here. So let me. So why is pretty evident. But let me talk about what microarticulometry uh, is. What I'm trying to do about it. Um, so it all starts with the observation that voice carries information. Right? We make judgments about people from their voices all the time. How many times have you heard? somebody on the phone and thought, this person is old, this person is happy, this person is sad. He sounded like a man who has slept well and didn't owe too much money. We do it so easily that we don't even realize it. And here's an example. If I play out just one of these and ask you who the voice belongs to. A remarkable ride only here in America. I was born in. I think everyone got it. So you just judged uh, the person's ethnicity from voice. But you know what? You judged a lot more. Here's a remarkable ride only here in America. I was born in. You judged the person's gender, the person's age, the person's social background, ethnicity, state of mental health, and state of physical health, all in two seconds. Right? You judge things like height from voice. You don't even realize it. If I play these two examples. So I, I have this little trick because I, I can't. And, the, and, you know, it is a black comedy. It's very strong theme. Who's the taller person? The first one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the first one. The first one is six foot eight. He was uh, Brad Garrett. And the second one was Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, associate the watch to the person. Here is, we come back to leadership here. Standing on the stage, by speaking these words. Oh, sorry. Your ethnic or religious background, your orientation, or your social status. I think you get it. I think it's the it's the first one. How did you know? Why carries information? It carries more information than we realize. So it carries signatures of the speakers, and this is all from research papers in 30 different fields. There are 30 different fields that have reported results on uh, human voice. There are more than 400 scientific journals that report results on the human voice. 
It carries signatures of your physical parameters, height, weight, body shape, skeletal structure, physiological parameters like age, presence of uh, medications in the body, behavioral parameters, medical parameters, <coughs> demographic parameters, your age, geographical origin, sociological parameters, environmental parameters. It even carries signatures of your surroundings, where you are at the time of speaking. If you are in an enclosure, what is the size of the enclosure? What is the what are the walls made of? What is the ceiling made of? What is on the floor and things like that. And voice forensic profiling is the concurrent deduction, and I will explain why it has to be concurrent. Concurrent deduction of a deduction of all of these parameters from the human voice. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right. So speaking of information, where can where is this information in the human voice? People have been studying various representations of the human voice for a long time. Where are these signatures? Why have they not measured it? And if they have been measured, what are those? Right? So in order to understand that, we have to understand a little bit about the human speech production process. Now the human vocal tract is a resonance chamber. If you had a building of that um, size and shape, and you imagine a person yelling in the building, it would, if it were a large building, what would we expect to hear? Resonances, echoes, right? So, when we speak, air comes out of our lungs, and we have two vocal cords in our, in the, in, for men it's in the Adam's apple here, for women it's over here. These two vocal cords are actually membranes that vibrate in response to the air coming out. And when they vibrate, they produce what is called an excitation signal, and that signal resonates in your vocal tract. And we produce different sounds. When I say we produce, I'm producing a succession of different sounds in sequence so that you can you, you understand my word. Produce is per or to use. This is many sounds in succession. And I'm doing that by by moving my articulators, my tongue, jaw, lips, all of these so that the shape of the vocal chamber, chambers is changed. And every time we produce a different sound, the resonances are different as a response to the change. And we hear the resonances. So where is the information? What you see on top is just a voice signal in the time domain. What is below is a spectrographic representation, where the y-axis is frequency, the x-axis is, is time. And the color at any uh, pixel is the energy in that frequency at that time. And what you see are the resonance patterns. The high energy bands that you see there are the resonance patterns. So where is the information? In this particular one representation, and there could be many, many representations that we derive from the speech signal. In this one representation, it is in time, in time frequency, and in frequency. And I'll shortly show you examples. But what I do want to point out is that this is viewable and interpretable by humans. The patterns here are viewable. They are not necessarily embedded in such representations, and they are not necessarily viewable or, or uh, interpretable by humans. So let's see some uh, interesting examples. So the cues, as I said, are in time, time frequency and frequency. So I'm going to skip over this. Here is an example of a little boy saying three, three, three. Um, okay, never mind. Um, three, three, three. All right, so what you see is that here is a spectrogram. When we produce a word like three, the first sound is th, and the second one is r. When we, the sound th doesn't require your vocal folds to vibrate. Your vocal folds are stationary. And the, that sound is produced by creating an obstruction in your vocal tract, building up the air pressure behind it, and suddenly releasing it. And what you see here, what the arrow pointing to, is the turbulence after the release of the th, that uh, obstruction. The sound immediately after is r, and it requires your vocal folds to vibrate in the, in the full capacity. So in going from a state of complete rest to a state of full motion, 
there is a short time that elapses, and that is called the voicing onset time. This is something my colleague Yossi works on extensively. Um, this is a micro feature. This is information. This voicing onset time depends on the inertia of your vocal tract. And that inertia is different for different people. It is unique to you. It is not only different for different people, it is different for different combinations of sounds that each person produces. That's, that's a very important identifying factor. Here's another example. So that was an uh, example in time. This is in time frequency. This is... Um, oh, I pop by the tail of the man. Pop by the tail of the man. So this was, uh, this was produced by Jack Morrison back in 1935 and I picked this example because it is, in those days they were not digitally altering the recordings. Um, so it, what you see here is pristine. So what I want to show you are, you can easily see the, the way the frequencies uh, undulate over here. The, that frequency modulation, is, you can see that it's different for different sounds that he produces as he sings. That's another very important characteristic that can be used to identify uh, a person. It is very unique to you. You're not going to have the same frequency modulation in every voice sound that you produce. <coughs> Here's another example, and this is in frequency. That was in time and frequency. This is in frequency. Now, I've done some image processing on that uh, representation on the spectrogram. And what you see the red arrow pointing to are what I call harmonic bandwidths. So I take the peak energy in each harmonic um, in the spectrogram and I outline uh, it where it falls to 3 dB from the peak energy. And you can see that the harmonic bandwidth is different for different harmonics. It's that particular pattern is very, very characteristic of a person. So these are all micro features. This is all information that we cue in on when we, I think, make judgments about other people. The question is, how do we measure all of this? Oh, here's another uh, interesting example. And this is about how different parameters have an effect on voice. And this is about age. This is the Queen of England. She, every year she makes a Christmas broadcast. They are available, uh, she's been making that for 50 years plus, it's available from their website. They have a website, the British Monarchy. This is where she makes the broadcast from. Uh, here is a different representation, a constant Q representation of her voice 50 years apart. And our voice, we all know, changes with age. 25 years ago, that was when she was uh, very young. What are the features of growing old? Yes, sir. This is when she is older. And in this representation, you see this word and this word are the same. What you will observe here is that the harmonics have smeared and the entire um, uh, the pitch has also lowered. So this is some of what happens to us with age. And we, um, if we measure this, we could relate it to age and deduce age from just one of uh, these characteristics. But there are many other things that happen to us with age. So the, what we do um, for profiling is it begins with microarticulometry. Microarticulometry is the science of measuring the microscopic properties of articulation. Um, what we do is we fragment the speech signal. We've been working on robust speech recognition for uh, a very long time at Carnegie Mellon, and we can actually articulometrically, consistently fragment speech signals very well in very high noise environments. So we study these fragments, and I guess the question that you might be asking yourself is how much information can be in fragments of speech? I'll show you examples. And then we measure the micro properties of uh, these features. So uh, here's an example of uh, the sound A from the word A spoken by many nine year olds. They've been automatically extracted by our algorithms. And uh, this is how it sounds. So you might have noticed that you were able to discern accent just from these A sounds, from these kids. In fact, 
micro fragments of speech at, at until, until about 120 of a second can actually be perceptually uh, discerned by a human ear. But beyond that, we need other techniques to derive the uh, information in there. So uh, the challenges before us in microarticulometry are how to measure the micro features. They must be computed with high precision. We don't have um, a large margin of error. How to disaggregate the influences. If you, if you do derive a pattern or if you do uh, discover a pattern, the human voice is influenced by so many, many different factors that you need to be sure that uh, the patterns indeed relate to the parameters or the, uh, that you're looking at and not to the others. How do you actually devise algorithms to disambiguate these influences? That's another challenge. And then, of course, the machine learning challenge is how do you predict speaker attributes from these micro features? So I'll talk a little bit about some of these. <coughs> Um, starting with the role of AI, let me skip this. Um, you see how much time do I have? Okay. okay. So let me just uh, cut to the chase. Uh, so the role of AI in profiling, as I see it, is as follows. <coughs> we need AI techniques for the discovery of microfeatures because many of these are not perceptible uh, or interpretable to humans. We need AI for the measurement of microfeatures, for finding relations between features and parameters, for disambiguating the mixed influences, prediction of parameters, and even data collection for analysis. Um, this is where we use reinforcement learning to elicit the right parameters and responses from humans. Okay, uh, let me skip this. So I have the wrong set of slides, which is why you're seeing me skip many of these uh, slides over here. So let me talk about what we do for feature discovery. So for feature discovery, there are multiple techniques that we can use. One of the techniques that are not mentioned on these slides is to find proxy features. Now, we do understand from uh, the way we make human judgments is, uh, and from the studies that I showed from Jody Kilman that voice quality encodes a lot of uh, information that we use to make judgments about the people. But voice quality is a very subjective um, entity. It is actually made up of 23 or 24 different sub-quality features. And these features are like breathiness, nasality, raspiness, they're described as such. They're, um, when people study these, they do so on um, very subjective scales using human subjects. If we are not able to quantify these, we're not going to be able to automatically profile humans. How do we quantify them? One of the way to, uh, ways to do it is to use what I call proxy features. Proxy features are features that are, for example, you take nasality. Any feature that has a high correlation with nasality, and we, we need to search for those features, and can be quantifiable, can be used as a proxy for nasality. For example, if I train a neural network to uh, classify between nasal and non-nasal sounds, at the end of the day, when it is able to do that, I can be fairly sure that the internal representations do classify any incoming sound on a relative scale, or you can think of it as a rating scale for nasality. It is a quantitative uh, scale, which can then be used to measure nasality. So I would call I would call that classifier as something that generates a proxy feature. Um, we use other techniques such as spotlight neural networks for uh, for micro features. Spotlight neural networks are just um, think about uh, convolutional neural networks where the the uh, filters are actually spotlight filters. So this is what I meant when I said my talk is at a very high level. I did not have time to actually prepare the, the in-depth slide for this. Um, of course, my uh, uh, colleague Yossi has done a lot of work on structure prediction algorithms for measuring some of these micro features. Um, so these are some of the things that we use for discovery. But let me just uh, give you one little example of how uh, feature discovery can be engineered. So let's say I 
would like to find a micro feature or a bunch of micro features that are relatable to one parameter, let's say height or something, height. Okay, and I want to automatically uh, discover those features. I don't want to be sitting and uh, looking for patterns that relate to height on spectrograms. I want to automatically discover them. However, I want to impose certain properties on those features at the get-go. And these properties are as follows. I know that the information may be in some high-dimensional mathematical space. I want to derive it. So my first condition is that it must be lower dimensional. Whatever the micro feature that I derive must, must encode the information in some lower dimensional space. It must have a specified distribution. Speech does have a Gaussian distribution. Right? I would like to impose that on speech and its features. It must reflect the forensic parameter. And the forensic parameter at this point is height, let's say. It must reflect that parameter. How do I impose all of these constraints and, um, and uncover or discover the micro feature? The trick is very, very simple. It's actually deceptively simple. So I have, let's say I, I have a spectrogram of a snippet of speech from you, and I want to discover the micro features that relate to height. So I have an encoder, X is the spectrogram, I have an encoder E, and my feature in the latent space I represent as Z, right? So I reduce the input signal to a low dimensional latent representation to begin with. Now, I need to be sure when I do this, E is the encoder and that encoder could be anything. But when I do this, I need to be sure that the information is indeed captured in that latent space. And the simple way we all know to do this is to use that information to reconstruct the signal. Use a decoder G. It's, that's not a different talk, so don't worry about the decoder. Um, so use a decoder G and reconstruct the signal. Have a reconstruction loss that you minimize in the process. And when you're done training in this way, you're sure that the information you want is embedded in the latent space. However, I have two other uh, constraints that I must impose on this Latin representation. One was that of Gaussianity or some any other distribution that I would like to impose. And I can do that by, uh, so okay, uh, the encoder and decoder in our case, what I'm working with, are both convolutional uh, neural networks. E is a convolutional network, G is a deconvolutional network. So, uh, right, in order to impose the distribution that I want to impose in the latent space, I could use a uh, generator P, which would again also be a neural network, and I transform a standard random variable uh, using that to the desired distribution as follows. I take Y could be some, some random variable, uh, P imposes the, distribu uh, the distribution that I want on that by outputting a variable Z uh, tilde over there. And what I want to do is I define a scatter loss and I link the two to a discriminator so that the latent representation Z is maximally distinguishable from the uh, from z tilde. D is the job of the the job in life of the discriminator is to be able to well distinguish between or well discriminate between z and z tilde. The encoder, however, is trying to generate z so that it it is it it the discriminator is not able to discriminate between the two. In, in other words, I'm, I want to generate Z so that it is maximally close to Z tilde. So what you have here is a GAN uh, setup, as you can see. And you can see how at the end of the day, this will be able to impose Z hat on Z after training. Now, the third condition I had was to uh, be able to uh, uh, predict a forensic parameter, and I took the example of height in our case. 
using this setup. And in order to do that, I have another simple trick. I let me skip this. I'm trying to go a little faster because I have a different set of slides here. Um, so I find a forensic loss. And I have, so again, P could be a neural network. The discriminator D is a neural network. I define a forensic loss with and put together another network, which is a, a discriminator that tries to simultaneously predict height as the whole setup is training. And now you can see that I would have Z so that I have it in the low dimensional space that I want. I would have the distribution imposed on it, the distribution that I want imposed on it. And at the same time, it would be able to, uh, uh, it would be able to best predict the one forensic parameter that I want to predict, which is height. But this still doesn't take care of the problem of disambiguation. There may be other forensic parameters that that could uh, that this uh, uh, micro feature could confusingly also predict. And in order to take care of that, I don't have the slides here. All I need to do is to add a series of discriminators, each of them with their own specific loss, trying to predict the specific parameters that are confusable in the feature space. At the end of the day, the discriminators and the entire setup, if you have set up the losses correctly, would be able to give you the maximally disambiguated um, uh, features that you can get. So this is the process of feature discovery that we are putting together. And it is just one of the three different things that we're doing. I'm not going to talk about the other two. Um, let me just skip this. How much time do we have now? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So this, I'm, I'm coming to the more interesting part, which is how do we deal with voice disguise? So the two things to remember in dealing with voice disguise is that we cannot, humans cannot change our vocal tract configurations a lot. There's a limit to how much we can change. You can, and the second thing is that we can only change what is within our control. There are a lot of things about our voice that are not within our voluntary control. So uh, the first thing is your breath. So there are these jokers out there who make hoax calls, and I've been uh, looking at all of these voice-based crimes. They try to change their voice. And my question was, how do I profile accurately in the presence of uh, voice disguise? But what these jokers forget about is that although they change their voice, they have to breathe. And so if you look at their breath, and especially the intervocalic breath sounds, your speech is a, a, as much a mental process as it is a biomechanical process. You are thinking as you are speaking, you know what you're going to say next. So the volume of air that you intake between sentences, between pauses, is proportional to what you expect to be saying. And it is a sharp sound that resonates in your vocal tract. And those resonances have patterns. Let me play this out to you. Just breath sounds. You can see the patterns over there. So we have a paper that we put out on an archive, I think, recently that, um, that shows how we can identify people just through their breath sounds. Um, now, about what is this guy? This is another example. So, what can we say about this person? I thought that he was just going to keep it to himself because I had explicitly asked him not to put on your neck. I give this example uh, because I want to show how traditional um, uh, knowledge can be used to catch voice disguise. So, what did you think about this sound? Yeah, what, oh, should, okay. Can you guess what this person is like? And I thought that he was just going to keep it to himself because I had explicitly asked him not to put on your neck. Can you guess what this person is like? Young, old? Young, white, female. Right? Young, white, female. Okay, let me now, I'm, I'm just talking about traditional uh, knowledge here. Let me uh, explain a little bit about vocal track excitation. 
So when we speak, our vocal folds come together uh, periodically. And what you see on top is the contact between vocal folds with time. So when the contact is high, the air doesn't get through. So the energy is low here. Amplitude of, uh, the low one is the amplitude of uh, the pulse exciting the vocal tract. So the energy is low and the sound is low. Right? And then it goes down and low, high and low. So you get what are called the, the pitch patterns or pitch pulses. And here you see two different, the pitch pulses of two different people. In one, they are very well separated. In the other, they're not that well separated. They're running into each other. And there are, there are physical reasons for it. I'm not going to go into that. But just know that they, they could run into each other. Now we see an example. Okay? So let me just play this out. The Okay. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing the... I do a really bad air novel. Yeah, on purpose? But no, I just no. I mean, everything I say, you know, it's like you do the the I don't know much. But then it's also, you know, it also comes out like rolling down the street, smoking in nose. <laughs> this is a man. This is a man doing a falsetto, and you can see the the part where the pitch pulses are separate are his normal ones, the, the part where they run into each other are the part where he's doing the falsetto. And I wouldn't play the lower one, that is from a normal woman. A normal woman with her pitch pulses well separated out. Now, if you, if I take the earlier uh, recording that I uh, played out. I thought that he was just going to keep it to himself because I had explicitly asked him not to put it on the end what do you see? The pitch pulses are running into one another. It turns out a man cannot imitate a woman without this happening. And so that was not a white female, young female. It was this guy. Go for it. Hello, internet. This is Brad Bittner. I am, I guess, running my role. So I'm here to see Girl, what
the ones in yellow were are the sounds that he was uh, not able to change. And based on those, uh, we've solved several cases. Um, so here's a, another example. Um, it's, it has to do with the uh, cattle ranchers. It has to do with the uh, cattle auctioneers, actually. It turns out in the United States, there is an annual um, World Livestock Auctioneering Championship. Now, this is all about what happens to the human voice what is the limit, extent to which humans can change their voices? And this is part of that study. These people, okay, so here's how World Livestock Auctioneering Championship works. What you see on the left is an arena. The cattle come in from one side and go out the other. And in that time, the auctioneers who are standing in the center have to sell the maximum number of cattle at the highest price. And it's a very short time, so in order to do that, they speak like this. Okay. Some of what's disguised is done by changing the speaking rate, and this is all about studying the speaking rate. Um, let me skip this. This was last year's convention, um, and I was asking the audiences to go to it. Um, this person is Blaine Lotz. He was a world champion in 2014. And I'll show you snippets of his voice later. Uh, but here's part of how he also okay, that woman is is his mother. She's also an auctioneer. She went to auctioneer. They have a good auctioneering school for it. And her father was also an auctioneer. So here's Blaine Rhodes. And they not only understand him, they buy the, the cabin, right? Here's where he explains how he... All right, so let's keep going a little bit here. So dollar bill now one. Dollar bill now one. Go two. Go two. Give three. Give three. How about four? How about four? Bid five. Bid five. Six here. Six here. Now seven. Now seven. Bid eight. Bid eight. Give nine. Give nine. Ten. 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 Eleven. Eleven. Twelve. Twelve. I'm going to name them thirteen. <laughs> it turns out, one look at this. And people who study speech will tell you the one thing that is relevant here. It turns out that when we change our speaking rate, we push all our energy in the low frequencies because the discriminatory information between the different sounds that we produce is in the lower frequencies, much more than in the higher frequencies. So, and people who are imitating other people by changing their speaking rate cannot do so consistently. So the way in which they push the frequencies in the, in the energy in the lower frequencies across different sounds is different, and it's not consistent. That's how you can catch what's disguised, if it is of that sort. So that was just an example, and I'll close with a couple of uh, very short slides about my latest work. Um, so, let me, okay, here's my latest work. In December of uh, 2017, we were able to produce the first human face from voice alone. Um, and we used uh, a new method that we call corrective training for this. I'm not, uh, of course, don't have the slides uh, explaining that method. But you can see on top is the ground truth. On the lower uh, lineup is uh, the faces reconstructed from voice. They're not very, very accurate. But what I'm happy about is that they're not dinosaurs uh, right now. They are human faces. I think it is, uh, we may not be able to reconstruct every nuance of the human face from voice, but I believe that we can reconstruct the average, uh, like most of the broader characteristics of the human face from voice. And not only that, my entire group now is working towards one goal, which is to reconstruct the entire human form in 3D from voice. And that is using all, um, an ontology of relations between what is directly related to the voice by way of facial structure and skeletal structure. I'm working with a group of anthropologists in Penn State University for this. Um, tracking back to the body structure, you can predict height, weight, and all of these things from voice. So you can use all that information to fill in a body frame and reconstruct the human frame in 3D. 
it can be done and it will be done this year. Um, and then this is for the skeptics. Um, all right. Um, I firmly believe that it can that that we will be able to do it this year. And this is what I was talking about at the World Economic Forum. So I will stop here. Thank you. My slides don't stop, obviously. Um, but Yes, of course. Detecting uh, early uh, stage lung cancer by just speaking to the... Absolutely. Uh, so, what is, if you look at the medical literature, ha is being increasingly recognized as a biomarker for many, many diseases. Of course, lung diseases uh, are at the top of the list, but diseases like uh, dementia, uh, uh, Parkinson's, Huntington's, lots of other diseases. I think, it's my personal thinking, I'm not 40 anyway. I think everything that influences your physiology, influences your mind, is going to influence your voice. Because it's such a complex biomechanical process that's controlled by your mind and everything that's happening in your body. In fact, one of my students uh, studied voice before and after people took coffee. And it turns out voice has... Uh, your voice changes in response to stimulants, of course you know that, but you can tell half an hour after the fact, from voice alone, with very high accuracy, whether a person has had coffee or not. So... I can say whether it was cappuccino or espresso. <laughs> 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 we haven't studied it to that level, but in answer to your question, it has huge implications in cell medicine. There are parts of the world where you have one doctor for 400,000 people, Rwanda, for example. But, and the, and uh, telephone services are expanding much faster than healthcare services. Those people are likely going to have phones. There are more phones on this earth than there are people at this point. So those people are going to have phones faster, sooner, than uh, they have healthcare. Do you need so. before and after uh, speech uh, examples? Well, Those not from the same person. If, if we had, and Yossi has been working a lot on in, in this area as well. If we have speech from uh, healthy people, and in contrast speech from people with certain afflictions, then uh, it's, if those afflictions affect your muscles in any way, then you, we will be able to tell the difference between the two. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.